from Relay FM. This is Upgrade, episode 513. Today's show is brought to you by Delete Me, Uni Pizza Ovens, and Wild Grain. My name is Mike Hurley, and I'm joined by Jason Snow. Hi, Jason. Hi, Mike. We're halfway to 1024. Uh, just past the 512 mark on Incredible. our way up to 1024. Off yeah, Off we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm back. Mm-hmm. I was away last week. Thank you very much to Stephen and Federica for filling in. For me, you know how much joy it gave me that you mentioned multiple times that it took both of them to replace me. Yeah. So thank you for yeah, that yeah. present. Two hosts in a trench coat. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, well, originally the idea was episode 512. We're going to have Stephen fill in for you. Mm-hmm. He could talk to me about my iPad review. Um, and then I discovered over the weekend that one Federico had written a, a very long article about iPad uh, failings, and two, he didn't get one to review in time. So I had pr- proceeded under the assumption that, although I thought Federico would be the perfect guest for, for that episode, um, because he's got his own stuff and he was he would be prepping under the same embargo as me and all of that, that there was no point in even trying uh, to get him on the podcast, he's got, he was he would be just too busy to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I discovered over the weekend that that wasn't the case, and so it was so good to be able to get him on for a little bit in there. I was up real early because he's way out there yep. in Italy, and then uh, and then Stephen as well. So yeah, it was fun. Yeah, it was a good time, and uh, I liked that that you had both, and I think it was good for the show to have Federico yeah. on and, and to do all of that. Yeah, uh, before we begin today, I would like to. Uh, before we fully begin today, I would like to uh-huh. invite our listeners to look at their podcast app because we have refreshed the artwork for Upgrade. So we it's trust true. our designer here at Relay FM, JD Davis, to take the old Upgrade art, the existing Upgrade art, and just give it a fresh coat of paint. We did not want to rebrand the show in any way. It's not. We're very happy with it but we wanted to give it more of a new feel. Uh, So we have both for Upgrade and for Upgrade Plus, we now have more consistent branding between the two as well. Um, It's uh, Upgrade is in, I guess, silver or space Uh gray, and Upgrade Plus is in space black, I guess. Or midnight, or I don't know. Yeah, something like that. And the artwork looks more like an actual button, which is uh, like a power button, because that's what the the logo is. And we've got a nice little glow going on too. So they're both new. It's available now for you to look at. And uh, I don't know. It's more of a refresh. I think we both felt this, that Upgrade maybe felt like one of the older it was well it was one of the oldest shows in the network Un- so the logo was untouched for untouched. 512 episodes correct untouched yes. Un- absolutely zero <laughs> had changed and it was maybe time for a refresh uh and right. so we'd but we also and didn't want to change it i mean we talked no, about it, it. it was like we actually are very happy with the idea of the of the circle with the button and the mm-hmm. arrow and the whole thing and so that was the real challenge in working with jd is like jd change it but don't change it and yep. uh so I, I just think it looks nicer and we had a there's there was a really uh subtle like pattern on the background it's like a pin strip and it didn't it didn't really work it didn't really resolve and when it did resolve sometimes it seemed like more like a a weird uh error <laughs> right yeah. so it's like this is better it's just cleaner and better and nice and it makes reference to apple's uh uh various metal non-colors mm-hmm. which is uh delights me yeah, so it's really good stuff. Thank you, JD, for that for the amazing work on this one, and, and I hope that you all enjoy our refreshed uh, artwork for the, as we yes. barrel towards episode one thousand and twenty four. Indeed, uh, we have a snow talk question to fully start officially start this week's episode. Yeah. It mm-hmm. comes from Daniel, who says, "Jason, I couldn't help but notice." You casually dropping an old man river reference last week when talking about the iPad Pro, which was tote that barge, lift that bale. Jason, what is your favorite musical? Okay, well, it's not Showboat. And in fact, I was just making tote that barge, lift that bale. It like entered the lexicon. So I I wasn't actually intentionally making Uh. a reference to Rodgers and Hammerstein. Although I think technically my official answer for what my favorite musical is, is The King and I. So Rodgers and Hammerstein, but a different one. Uh, it was my mother's favorite musical, my favorite, my mom's favorite movie, maybe. Um, and I have seen it in in uh, twice, including once with Yul Brenner when he was uh, sort of returned to the role when I was a kid. We went and saw it, went down to San Francisco to see it. Um, and it's sweet. It's very sad at the end. The king dies. It's very sad. Spoilers. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, well, you know, spoilers for uh, musical from the fifties. And uh, are there are there some thematic issues with? 
<laughs> with the king and I, yeah, yeah, there are. But uh, I, I have a great uh, fondness for it. In terms of like a modern, I don't know. I mean, Hamilton's the easy answer. I love Hamilton. It's it's still still doing it for me. I, I still think it's great. But but my classic answer is the king and I. Uh, thank you very much for that answer, Jason. I assumed you were going to say Hamilton. To be honest, uh, mm. it's, it's mine too. I know. It's I did a whole episode on uh, "Corner in the Sky" Quinn Rose's uh, podcast about musicals on the Incomparable. I did a whole episode with her about uh, the King and I. So I will put that in the show can notes. Listen to that if they want. Yeah, I will find it and put it in the show notes. Sure, I'll find it for you. Oh, that even <laughs> better. Thank you notes. so much. Why doesn't everybody find it and also put it in the show notes if you don't mind? Uh, thank mm. you so much. To Daniel for sending in that question. If you would like to send in a Snow Talk question of your own, all you need to do is go to upgradefeedback.com, send one in. I have some follow up. So, first comes from Scott, who says On the last episode, Jason mentioned that he wished that the keyboard backlight brightness for the Magic Keyboard is an option in Control Center. Well, it is. Yes. It is. It turns out the people I was talking to at Apple about it didn't even realize that it was there. Uh oh. <laughs> which is funny. <laughs> Uh, but yes, there it is there. You can put it there, and then you can swipe down from Control Center. I still think the point remains that you should be able to do it from the keyboard. Mm -hmm. I also was told that apparently if you are using it and it's off and you are in a dark place, it comes on. I don't know if that's true or not, but I was told that. I, I have not verified that yet. I find that kind of amazing if that's true. So it may be that I just don't notice and also, it's true that I, I basically leave it off because I very rarely am using it somewhere where I need the backlighting on. I generally leave keyboard backlighting off. Mm. But what I do find valuable is if I'm suddenly, I find myself in a place where I need the keyboard backlighting, I would really like to be able to just use the little, uh, I, I know the argument there is, well, if you can't see the keys, how can you use them? And I know where the keys are, but I would like to see the backlighting and, on a little keyboard thing. But yes, you can put it, you can add it to Control Center. Um, through the settings app and then you can uh, I, I would also argue probably should just sort of be one, a, a secondary control under brightness and not its own little button but you mm -hmm. know whatever it's there and you can add it to, to control center yeah and we get uh, we have some chat room feedback instantly that says yes it does turn on in the dark so there's that too look at that and I, I just want to say numerous podcasts over the last few few weeks have acted as if there isn't backlighting on the magic keyboard on either one, which is funny because it's always been there. It's it's like, uh, I think I said this last week, it's like a, a Berenstain Bears kind of thing. It's like a Mandela effect <laughs> thing where everybody sort of has agreed to pretend that the Magic Keyboard didn't have backlighting, but it's always had backlighting. The Obviously, the, the, the smart keyboard thing that was just the fabric can't have it, but the Magic Keyboards have backlighting. Yeah. Uh it was quite funny, actually, about the, the uh, control center thing. I was standing next to Federico at the event, and it was one of the first things he did was check for in control center to see if there was a button there, I don't, I, that, which was kind see? of funny to me. It, it is. I just I don't know why you don't use a modifier in the, for, the, yep. for the backlight, for the uh, lighting brightness controls to have it be the backlighting instead. I just I don't know. But then again, iPad OS kind of broken when it comes to global modifier keys. Sure, so sure, 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 sure. Maybe that's why. Uh, it makes sense to me in a way that it could detect. I mean, I'm sure that iPads have um, brightness sensors sure. like the iPhone true does tone. too, right? That's how you do true yeah. tone. So yeah. it makes sense that they have the ability yep. to do that. It's pretty cool. Isn't it nice? They, they've got that wired up, even though I've never really... i I got to be honest. I mostly use the Magic Keyboard mm -hmm. outside <laughs> in my backyard writing mm -hmm. or, or in a well-lit room in my house during the day when I'm working. I'm very rarely working on the iPad at night in the dark right like it, it just doesn't happen that often i'm not i'm not a a a, a secret black site ipad writer mm. i'm not that so uh but it's good to know that it's there so there you go all right next next piece of follow-up comes in next follow-up next follow-up comes in Ding. from paul who says <laughs> jason mentions that he prefers to type on the magic keyboard on the 13-inch iPad, but he rocked an 11-inch MacBook for many years. Was the keyboard on the MacBook not similar in size? Okay, first off, I do not rock anything. Only Casey Liss rocks things. I just use them. I just or wear them. I don't rock. I just want to, I'm just filing as a, as a complaint here. Sorry, Paul, the, you are the one who has prompted me to do this. But one of those things that I'm against is referring to the utility of anything, utilization of anything as rocking it. 
And I can tell you from my own personality, I do not rock anything. Well, Jason, literally anything. I will say in my that life you rock me rocked. like a hurricane. Just so you know, I'll okay, you know that. Great. Here I am. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Acknowledged like a hurricane. Um, uh, I did use an 11 inch MacBook Air for a long time, and it's a full size keyboard, and all the keys are the right size, is my as my recollection. And ever and there are there are shrunk down keys on the 11 inch uh, Magic Keyboard. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's, it's so okay. I, I'm just gonna say, Jason in the chat room said this is the most old man thing I've heard Jason say. Honestly, using rock to discuss to refer to things that you're doing, that's what an old man says. That's, every time I hear Casey do it, I'm like, Casey, you're way too old to be saying you rocked a hat. Don't do it. Stop it now. Oh, oh man. After the show, I'm gonna have one of those moments where I have to text Casey and say, Casey, you gotta listen to the follow up on upgrade. Anyway, listen yeah. anyway. You know he's good. Uh, Magic keep iPad Magic Keyboard. Some of the keys are, are like half width, and it's squished, and it doesn't feel right. So it is my my. What I would say is no. Uh, to me, the 11 inch Air was the exact width that you could make a computer and still have a regular keyboard, and the size of the 11 inch iPad is too narrow for that, uh, but I don't have them with me, so I can't like I can't verify this. But that's my recollection is that it's just a little bit too small, and there are some half. Uh, the one that bothers I know John Gruber is driven insane by this is the idea that the left bracket key is full width and the right bracket key is half width because is imbalanced and and he when i saw him in new york he said to me at one point why don't you make them both the same width Mm. it's like well because they don't (laughs) because they you get to the edge it's like writing on it's like john mulaney thing about writing on a on a big sign and you start like wait with the letters way too big and then you get to (laughs) the end and you're like oh no what have i done it's like that they get to the last (laughs) key on the keyboard and they're like oh no there's no room left well make it smaller and Uh it's fine it's a little like that that's funny uh, I also wanted to just let our listeners know we have a very small amount of tickets that are still available for our live show in London this coming July to celebrate 10 years of Relay FM. I'm going to be there. Jason's going to be there, along with many other awesome Relay FM hosts. So if you want to come, will and see Casey us be live, rocking it? Casey may be rocking it uh, along with us. He'll be rocking, we'll all be rocking together at an actual place where rock music is sometimes played at the Hackney Empire. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be on the 27th of July. There are still some tickets available if you want to come and celebrate and, and rock it out in style with us in London. Yeah, yeah, I'll be I'll be rocking a coin where I'll I'll and, <laughs> and flipping it. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, probably not. It's time for the B tales. Woohoo! Apple has announced a set of accessibility focused features coming in iOS 18. Uh, they are continuing their tradition of announcing these ahead of WWDC on Global Accessibility Awareness Day, which is really good because it gives these uh, items a time to shine where they're not going to get potentially overshadowed by other things. And we get to talk about them and people get to write about them and stuff like that, which I think is really great. Um, and I wanted to just run through some of these features. because I think there's some really cool stuff in here. Uh, the first up is eye tracking for iPad and iPhone, which uses cameras and sensors to track your eyes. And you select things by dwelling on them for a moment. So it's called dwell control. So this is a super cool feature. It uses the cameras and the sensors in the devices to be able to track your eyes. We spoke about this a while ago, and I wondered if it could. They, Apple could do something like this as a way to somehow control a home pod of a screen. It's like, hmm, maybe. But nevertheless, this is a super cool feature. And again, most of these things, I think basically all of them, they're somehow machine learning powered. Yeah. I, I was going to say, this seems to me that it's probably using similar algorithms, if not the same algorithms that they're using in the Vision Pro. Mm-hmm. I know Vision Pro, you know, the sensors are right up next to your eyes. They've got a really clear view. And here it's a little bit harder. Yes. But it does feel like this is kind of of a kind. And I would also say, I'm getting some strong, um, if you remember the pointer, the iPad pointer started in the accessibility yep. settings, yep. and and quite rightly, right? Like uh, accessibility. So here's the thing about accessibility: accessibility is important because one, everybody probably is going to need some accessibility. If they don't now, they will need it eventually. It's really important to ha- give as many people access in as many different ways to the things that we use to live our lives as yep. possible. Um, and again, again, I'll just say, if you're fortunate enough to to become an old person and use phrases like "I rocked it." Um, 
you will have motion <laughs> issues or balance issues or other. I mean, you will because just you'll getting, be getting older, you will use it. You, you'll be yeah, you'll be rocking you'll the be accessibility rocking. settings. Um, so it's super important for existing groups, uh, but you will become part of those groups at some point yeah. in your life as well. So you should think about that. But also, I would say sometimes this is one of those things where Apple's got interactions that it's not convinced are ready for the whole world but know that they have direct applications for people who have, for example, limited mobility issues. Yep. And so they put them in. It, it's not, what I don't want to say is it's like beta testing it because that's not what it is. It's more like, we don't think that this feature is maybe something that everybody can use right now, but we know some people who could really use it. Mm -hmm. And so they should have it. But I look at this and I think to myself, Wow, yeah, that that HomePod with a screen or even just an iPad in your kitchen, yeah. being able to do some basic interaction with that with gestures or eye movement yeah. uh, and, without touching it is really interesting for the future. And this is all, I mean, I, I read Shelly Brisbane wrote about this at Six Colors too. They, they briefed her about it, which was great. Um, it is just, I mean, for people with mobility issues uh, to be able to have this extra level of interaction is uh it's just really cool the idea that you're i mean it's like magic a little bit right yeah. which is sort of how i felt about the vision pro and now here it is in other devices where you're just sort of like willing the device to do what you want mm -hmm. that's great yeah and like we just had the double tap the apple watch double tap right which was it started as a motion control thing uh, on the apple watch and is now available in the shipping product as like a, a feature that you can assign for different things um which isn't, I'll admit, a great feature on the Apple Watch, but I do use it every day to start my mm. walking workouts. And it's, you know, I get to a certain yeah. point in my walk to and from the studio and it, my Apple Watch hits Ooh. me like it always does. And so I just, I don't even need to pull my sleeve down. I just tap my fingers together and it starts my workout. So these things can be very useful, even if you don't quote unquote need them for any particular reason. But they, and I think this is actually one of the things that I really like about Apple's approach to accessibility is they sometimes just create features that everyone can take advantage of, like dynamic type, for example. Dynamic type is really helpful if you have vision issues, but it's also just good for the general comfort of whatever you would prefer. Like for me, I'm able to take use of a dynamic type to have the text size be smaller on my phone. That's what I like, so I can ah. get more on the screen. Now, I can only do that because dynamic type exists, which is ostensibly... Right. An accessibility feature. Well, and it lets it lets people set. I mean, the broader way to view some of these settings is it lets people set uh, settings for their ability level, for their mm -hmm. capability level. So, in your case, with your eagle vision, you can just crank that text down, and it's fine. And uh, for somebody else, they they might like my my wife's uh, text is up a, up a notch. Well, yep. I think she's got reading glasses now, so she doesn't do that so much. But her her text all went up a notch so that she could see it. Uh, more clearly without glasses. So I mean, it's it's great. I mean, more stuff should be adaptable. Remember when I when I did that? Um, I think this is not entirely true anymore. But when I did that Tesla road trip back in the the day for spring break, where I borrowed that guy's yeah. Tesla and friend of the show, by the way, not just that guy, but I won't mention his name. Anyway, one of the things that because Lauren again, needs reading classes that we noticed is there were literally no text size settings in the Tesla UI. I think you can set a large setting now, but like, how did, how did that product exist for, for five or 10 years without like text adjustments? Like it, we, so we take a lot of things for granted in the Apple world, but the things like accessibility settings and, and dynamic text, dynamic type are super important. So moving on, there is music haptics where the, if you're listening to music in the music app, it will be able to sync to the haptic motor to provide real-time vibrations so people can feel the song. This is particularly helpful for people who have hearing issues. I remember there was a girl in my class uh, when I was in primary school, and at music class, she would put her hand on the speaker of the of the keyboard so she could feel, so she could more better feel and hear the music. Yeah. And I always found that fascinating. Yeah, totally. It was like a nine-year-old. And so they're putting this into the music app. Uh, vocal shortcuts. So this will allow you to set a phrase to trigger a shortcut without needing to use a wake word for your voice assistant. So you can just set a phrase and just say that phrase. And your phone is also always listening to that phrase, like out for that phrase, as well as the other things to invoke Siri. So 
This is a cool feature. This is this is the first time, right? That mm -hmm. I wonder if this is enabled by that um, feature where they took it down, so you didn't need to say "Hey" anymore. You could just yep. say the name and and summon the the beast. Yeah. <laughs> that but you know now what that this they've will got allow that. you to do. You could, for example, have a wake word to talk to ChatGPT or something, right? You could, you could, yeah. you could also have a shortcut trigger on Ahoy or yep. or Ahoy telephone Anything if you you'd want. like. Yeah. Uh, that's this could be a game changer, right? Like this yeah. is this is one of those uh, things that could really be a huge difference. That the uh, ability to arbitrarily um, set trigger phrases to mm -hmm. do things—that's wild. So I can't wait to see this in in action. Just be careful with the phrase that you use. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just like set your right. phone off all the time because <laughs> you set the phrase "Good morning." <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't recommend it. Wouldn't do that. Uh, listening for atypical speech. So using machine learning to, uh, to features to for better performance to understand those are speech issues. So if you, yep. this is for a variety, a wide variety of speech issues that to be able to better understand listeners and they use machine on device machine learning models to do that. Whether it's waiting for more time or allowing for somebody to repeat something, that kind of thing, which I think is really cool. Um, this one uh, I immediately sent to my wife. I imagine a lot of people sent this to somebody in their lives. It's called vehicle motion cues. So many people, many people suffer with motion sickness, especially in cars. My wife is one of these people. She looks at her phone in, in, in while she's in a car for too long or on a train or something. It can make her feel unwell. So they do this thing. I don't fully understand how this works, but I'm not a scientist. So I would just trust that it does. Where when you're looking at your phone, there are these moving dots that, that will like scroll down the side of the screen and they are synced to sensors in your phone that detect movement, which I'm sure are probably the same sensors that they use to detect car crashes, right? Like it's all that kind of stuff coming together. Like Apple, I'm sure I've done a lot of work of understanding how vehicles move at this point. And so it helps calibrate your body to understanding that there is motion when you're looking at a device to alleviate motion sickness. Incredible. Incredible. And again, it's like if this works, like I don't think this is something you would necessarily historically consider as a quote unquote accessibility feature, right? Yeah, all sorts of things are accessibility, right? Like the mm -hmm. whole point of accessibility is some people have an issue that causes them to have problems with some aspect of using the device, right? Fundamentally, that's what it is. And there's no like gatekeeping or there shouldn't be about like what are the issues what issues mm -hmm. matter and what is as a colorblind person i appreciate that there's an accessibility setting for me for my little thing which is i can use the phone you know i can mostly use it just fine but yes occasionally some device doesn't differentiate uh via a method other than colors mm -hmm. and there's a game or something where it, it says quick jason this this red, light red and this gray and this light green differentiate between them. And I'm completely unable to do that. So like they're all, it comes in all shapes and sizes. So really great work. I'm, I'm happy that they've put this out again. And I continue to be incredibly impressed by the amount of stuff that they do every year that that is new for accessibility. Like it's not just, there was also enhancements for CarPlay and Vision OS to bring those those platforms closer up to par with iOS and everything that it has. But to be able to come up with these five big features, along with, again, like at the at the bottom of the press release, there's another laundry list of smaller things that they've done too. Like it, It's very impressive to me that they're able to continue pushing it in this direction. I think it's very, very cool. Yeah, it's awesome. And I love that they give us a preview of essentially... Yep the next version of the OS mm -hmm. uh, before WWDC as a teaser in order to, I mean, sure there, I'm sure there was somebody who made the argument a few years ago inside Apple. That was like, you know, these are accessibility fe features. We're only a few weeks away from WWDC. We know what they're going to be. Why would we not take advantage of it to get another, I mean, another news moment and talk about our accessibility story rather than having it be totally swamped mm -hmm. by the conference and uh, super smart. And I'm glad that person won that argument. Mm -hmm. This episode is brought to you in part by our friends at delete me. Privacy is important to me. The information 
about me, my contact information, my personal information is something that I want to stay personal. I want to stay private. It's something that I care about. Uh, I choose what I want to divulge online, as we all should, and I want to be able to choose the things that I want to be private and don't want the world to know about. Do you ever wonder how much of your personal data is out there on the internet for anybody to see? It can be an uncomfortable thought, especially when you consider having too much information online could lead to identity theft attempts, phishing, harassment, unwanted spam calls. But now you can protect your privacy and your information with Delete Me. Having your personal information on the internet can feel a bit like leaving a door open. Delete Me can help you close and keep that door locked and all of your information safe. So you don't need to worry about waking up one day to find out your information has been compromised. It's why I use Delete Me. It removes any personal information that I don't want online and makes sure that it stays off. Delete Me is a subscription service that removes your personal information and from the largest people's search databases on the web and in the process helps prevent potential ID theft, doxing, and phishing scams. Delete Me does the hard work for you. You'll even get a regular personalized privacy report showing what information they found, where they found it, and what they removed. And it's not just a one-time service. They're monitoring regularly on your behalf. I love that Delete Me is out there in my corner. I get reports from them periodically. They tell me what's been removed, and they tell me also, like, hey, we've identified this stuff, and we're in the process. It's going to take, like, a month to delete it. Uh, we'll confirm when it's been done and let you know about it. Like, I really love that, and it is very satisfying to me to get that report to understand oh boy there's way more like my email address is in way more places online than i thought it was and delete me can make sure that it's gotten rid of take control of your data and keep your private life private by signing up for delete me with a special offer for listeners of this show you can get 20 percent off your delete me plan when you go to join delete slash upgrade 20 and use the promo code upgrade 20 at checkout the only way to get 20% off is to go to J-O-I-N-D-E-L-E-T-E-M-E dot com slash upgrade 20 and enter the code upgrade 20 at checkout. One last time, that is joindeleteme dot com slash upgrade 20 and the code upgrade 20. A thanks to Delete Me for their support of this show and Relay FM. It is time to saddle up for a rumor roundup, Jason Snow. Yeehaw. There's a bunch of stuff today in a variety of little containers. We're going to start by talking about some AI iOS 18 related rumors and news that's been going on over nice. the last couple of weeks. Uh, this is all from Mark Gurman <laughs> in some form. He's so, the sheriff. The sheriff is back uh, reporting that Apple will be using chips of its own making and design for powering their data centers for AI features in iOS 18. Apparently, the M2 Ultra will be the first chips used in these data centers. Mark Gurman expects that image and text generation, along with lengthy summaries, may need to be performed on these servers, with more simple tasks being done on device. He also references how this is kind of Apple's playbook for this kind of stuff, where they have things on their own data centers at first, and then they maybe spread them out a little bit, so they have them on different... Uh, cloud services. I think I think they use like Azure and AWS for some iCloud stuff, and he expects yeah. that that might be the future. But I was quite surprised to see this uh, that they will be one. I guess having their own data centers because we're going to get to some of the other stuff a bit. On it's, this this whole thing is getting a bit confusing and a bit um, muddled. So they actually they actually asked Tim Cook about it uh, on the on the analyst call, mm. and I think it was Tim might have been Luca Maestri, and they said the standard thing that apple does will be done here which is they'll do processing of things on device and they will have some of their own cloud services and they will use other cloud services like it was i i, I got the sense that it was a pretty straightforward sort of like they use their data centers for some things and then they use partners for other things and it's a mixture that will change over time and they they really pitched it as being kind of their standard procedure here mm -hmm. that they that they do some of this i do wonder if you know, they realized there was stuff that they weren't happy with doing on somebody else's server or whether there was a secrecy issue, um, whether they felt like they were better off kind of trying this out on their own and then using other servers for, for more volume down the road. But it is, it's really interesting, right, that they're trying to use their, um, their chips as a, uh, as a way to differentiate, I guess, or, or to power this in a way that they think maybe is better. It's, 
I, I don't, you know, we don't know what it is or how it works, but it's a really interesting idea that, that they might do it. I also wondered if it might be fallback kind of thing where on some of their devices, the power on the device is not strong oh. enough. And so that they might offload that to, to, into their cloud. You know what? That makes so much more sense to me, you saying that. I, I mean, the reason I am confused is about, is because of the next kind of two pieces of, Rumor around that I have for you. So the first part I'll say is Mark Gurman and Julia Love at Bloomberg are reporting that Apple is closing in on a deal with OpenAI to bring ChatGPT features to iOS 18. And then also Mark Gurman has reported on some Siri improvements. So Siri will feel more conversational. They're going to have a thing called proactive intelligence, which will summarize your notifications for you, offer things like news synopses and improvements to Siri suggestions across the operating system. They will also have AI photo editing. And in this report, Gurman says that Apple will not have a chat bot of their own. It's something they are technically not capable of with where they are right now with their own internal stuff. And they have executives that aren't thrilled with the idea in general of Apple making one of these things, which is why the open AI partnership could exist. So uh-huh. this is what is puzzling to me of like, well, what do they need in the cloud then? And where is ChatGPT or Google Gemini if that deal happens too? Where is that coming in? Right. And where is it not? And you mentioning the idea there of like maybe what Apple provides cloud services wise is stuff they can do on device on new devices, but can't do on device on old devices. And that's what they take care of. That's their it's, stuff. It's essentially what happens on the Apple Watch with yeah. Series 9 versus Series A, right? The idea that, or, or uh, Ultra 2, versus ultra one where it does it on device if it can and if it can't it doesn't and it uses the cloud and it just falls back to that that might be the case i also wonder the chatbot thing is so interesting right because it's very clear that a lot of people inside apple are still have been and are still skeptical about the chat chatbot thing and then other people are like what are you talking about everybody in the industry is excited about this we can't sleep on it no. and so you end up in a situation where they're like well hmm uh, you know, we'll do it, but we're going to outsource it. But what I wonder is what, where does the cutoff? Because Siri needs to have a conversational thing and be able to attach to more data sources and be more right. Like Siri needs some of that. Mm-hmm. And if you like, I'm worried that what Siri is going to have is something that's more more rudimentary than we might want to expect. That said, I'm not sure I need Siri to do what ChatGPT does, right? I, I'm not sure I really want Siri to go down too far down that path. I just want Siri to remember my conversation, understand the context, be more conversational and be more functional and give me the information I want, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, that's asking a lot, but like GPT, well, you could has a uh, chat gpt has this whole other set of things that you can throw at it so this is really interesting i don't know how you architect it so that there's just like a chat bot that eventually gets referenced i mean i i don't know how is there a chat it's bot app is there a chat know, bot right? in like, spotlight <laughs> or like what siri then Right, like, right. Is si- and what separates Siri? Does yeah. Siri say I couldn't find this, so I asked Chat GPT? Yeah, <laughs> it's very. So this is the, this is why it's confusing to me, right? It's like there's there's obviously lots of things they can do, and lots of things they may do, but then there are all these com- like reports which are quite conflicting. That it's becoming complicated to be able to follow what the story might end up being and that so that is is intriguing to me it it is increasing my intrigue but i'm also getting a little bit nervous sure too because they've kind of i don't no i I don't really think apple has the opportunity to whiff this i i I, they really need to impress people i think right i think i think though what may, we may be seeing is uh, Apple rapidly responding to this. And so things are not as locked and as clear yep. as they might be for a usual cycle. And that, that goes to who Mark Gurman talks to, mm-hmm. where as there always, may be, yep. you know, some people don't know what other people are doing because there's they're trying a bunch of different stuff. This also feels like maybe this summer's beta cycle is going to be extra beta where mm. they are also trying to figure out how to drop all this stuff in. Some of it sort of not last minute, but more last minute than Apple generally does this. And I also, I would expect that some of this is going to be, they're going to announce big in June. And some of this stuff is going to be, 
you know, October, and some of it's going to be December, and some of it's going to be March, but that they need to figure out, and they may be figuring out along the way, right? Like, how? let's change how this is integrated. I just, I, to come back to saying be, more beta than usual, um, I think a lot of this is going to be like, let's put it in there and see what happens, and then tweak it as we go. But um, I would expect that Apple's AI story, they're going to they're going to make a coherent, presumably, presentation about it. But I would think over the next few years, it's going to kind of be all over the place where they're going to be experimenting with things and and uh, changing as they go and changing their data sources and changing how their data sources are used. And, you know, I'm, I'm OK with that. I kind of expect that they're what they're not going to do is unveil a finished product. It's going to be a work in progress. But I hope yeah. there's a vision for how this all gets split up and i really the the thing that bothers me the most about the there will also be a chatbot window that that has chat gpt in it or gemini or whatever is that's the thing i don't i'm not convinced that that is the most appley approach to this it feels like uh like they're punting like they're basically like well we can't do that so we're just you want your chatbot here here's your chatbot you can have a chatbot if you want um, because what Apple's good at is integrating that stuff into the whole like experience and interface and having features. Yes. And it, it suggests to me that, that Apple still philosophically believes that, uh, that AI is a tool to be used by features and not a, a, an end unto itself. And they may be wrong about that, right? They might be wrong about that. And so that it's almost wrong. like, it's almost like a hedge where they're like, and there's a chat bot if you want it. And they may learn the lesson that, that, um, that people do want that. And I think by, by, so if it's a hedge, I mean, maybe that's a good thing because they will learn. And, and we've said this about a bunch of stuff that they've done recently. Like sometimes if you can force Apple to do it, like with the, like with the DMA, right. We're going to know if having alternative app stores and side loading is devastating to Apple's business and the security of its users hmm. Or not. We're going to learn it now because it's happening. And I feel like this is a little bit like that where uh, chatbots, are they not a thing that people actually want? Are they not a thing that works within Apple's interface? Maybe we'll find out. And that will settle some of those arguments internally, right? Some of those executives that German mentions who are like, mm, this is not a thing. This is dumb. We shouldn't do this. Like if, if their customers want it and they're using it, their arguments uh, fail. And that would be interesting to see too. Because I, I know I want to be able to have a conversation with my phone and have it understand what's going on. Yes. I, I, I don't yes. want to talk oh. to a chatbot, but it's separated from the device, right? Well, like, this, the, and that's the thing that gives me chills is, is this saying, oh, and there's a chatbot somewhere. Is that setting us up for a Siri that's not that's still not very good, right? Because the, the, the chatbot thing, the number one thing the chatbot teaches us is... Wow, Siri is bad. I, this is what I want, right? I want to have a conversation. And so German says Siri will feel more conversational. It's like, okay, but like, but that's what the chatbot is for. Mm -hmm. So that's what yeah, I, that's so what I'm worried is that this is resetting expectations about what Siri is going to do mm -hmm. to be like they they slapped on a new coat of paint and it's more conversational. But in the end, all it's really doing is a very limited number of on device model summary things. And the things we think of as what ChatGPT does, Siri's still not going to be able to do. And boy, that would be frustrating. So I have access to ChatGPT 4.0. Yeah, me too. Model. And I playing around with it. I, f I found it interesting. It was like I think it's I think it's very impressive. But I thought to myself, I want to I want to see this play out in a different way. So we're we're just we're on vacation. We're at Disneyland, and one morning I said to Adina, I was like, just talk to this thing. Just talk to it. And so she, she was like, you know, hi, how are you? Da, 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 having a little conversation. And she's like, can you give me some recommendations for places to eat, rides to go on? And like, it was in honestly incredible to just sit and watch this conversation unfold. And I was like, this is what Siri needs to be as a bare minimum for me of like, you should be able to ask it questions and it give you answers. Where hmm. so much of the time, like we just had this, where like a couple of days later, Adina asked Siri a question. Like she's out loud, asked the question. And it said, I found us on the web for you. And that was it. It's like, that is terrible. I know. Terrible. That is so, right. 
Yeah, well, that's 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 what they need to address, right? And yes. and uh, yes, this is like for all of their oh, we bet the company on AI now, and we pulled all the engineers off the car project and killed and all that. If Siri is still incapable. Like it's unacceptable. Mm-hmm. It's unacceptable. Now maybe, maybe the GPT is a fallback. Maybe it's going to get fed information from ChatGPT be great. or Gemini or whatever. Yeah. That is fine. But w- in the end, I do not want Siri to be like, "Well, I've reached the end of my knowledge. Here is a page you can read on your phone." Right? Because that's the worst part about it. Yes. Is it's not. Well, I found this thing on the internet that says this. What do you think? And then you answer and you continue the conversation. That's a more chatbot kind of experience. Mm-hmm. But when when Siri's just like, yeah, I can't do that. Uh, you, you, you're going to need to look at your phone now and look at this web page that I found. That is the web page you already looked at because it isn't helpful. And like that is they that yeah. So I I just I'm with you. I think a lot of this makes sense, and I do fundamentally believe that AI is not always a means to an end, and that the winners of using of leveraging AI technology have to make it friendlier, like put an interface on it. It's like the command line. It's a it's powerful, but like if you could do more with it and use the AI stuff behind the scenes to leverage it in other ways, I think that that's really powerful and an opportunity for Apple. But like, you you can't get the personal assistant wrong i mean you you can't and siri like man can you imagine if if they do this and then siri's just still bad and then there's also a chat bot but siri is still kind of bad and broken Uh, like or even i I think i think apple from each other too you know we could put this on another um uh, uh, phrase it in a different way which is i think apple's entire ai effort no matter what they do no matter how many new synopses and ai photo editing features they throw into it if Siri is bad, the rest of it doesn't matter. Yep. If Siri's still bad, if Siri is still terrible, and there are chatbots out there that are continuing to get all the hype, it will have it will be perceived and probably will actually be a failure. Like they gotta get that right. And the the German report is scary because it sort of suggests like maybe not. <laughs> and so we'll see, I I guess. But I'm I'm worried about it too. Cause you know, Siri was the f- the first one of these kinds of things. Like, this was what it was su- supposed to be. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it was supposed to evolve, which it never did. It never did. Or like it uh, took, It's better it than it used to be, steps, but, but, but the world not, has passed it by. Yeah. It's never taken a leap bigger than the initial one, right? Where, like, you, it, it came around, it's like, wow, this is amazing. Because nothing had done that before. And we forgave a lot of it, and it was great at doing what it could do. But it's never since taken a jump. It's like, oh, it's faster now. It can understand you better now. <laughs> but the answers yeah. aren't any more rich, really. Yeah. So I I don't know how they, I don't know how they square that. And again, Mark Gurman's challenge is that he is just hearing from individual people throughout Apple, and they all have a different experience of this. So it may be that these things are connected in ways that we don't understand. But yeah, I just, I, I, I got the same vibes, which is in the end, it starts with Siri. The whole the purpose of Siri, Siri's place in the interface is to do what people use chatbot, AI chatbots to do. Mm-hmm. That is why it's there. Yep. And if if it can't do that, or if the Siri team turns its nose up at the chat bots or there's a you know an executive somewhere who's just like no 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 we can't let the crown jewels of siri be tainted by gpt or something it's like no man like siri's busted it it needs uh it needs this technology and like that is so that's my fear it's almost more like an organizational fear with an apple is like okay apple's agreed that they're going to work with OpenAI and maybe Google on chatbot stuff. Okay, great. But like, what's that implementation like? And does it feel like it's being kind of held at arm's length and it's not actually improving? Like, do the people who won the argument to put chatbots in iOS have the clout to say, no, no, really put it in? Or are they going to like sneak it in, but people over, and I'm, I don't know that the Siri team feels this way, but just like theoretically the people behind siri are like okay you can put the chatbot in but it's not touching our stuff and our stuff is going to be like this and it's not good enough like that's a disaster 
So that and that that's a level where if stuff like that happens, it has to be high level executive, right? This is this is what Tim Cook gets paid for, right? The, the, the stuff like this. This is what uh, Craig Federighi gets paid for. And and Eddie Q, like all the senior management team, this is this is why they get paid the big bucks. Is at some point you do have to say uh, these people win the argument, <laughs> and I know that you don't like it for reasons, but they have to win the argument. And my fear is that we're going to see some hedging and not winning the argument here. And I'm not saying throw Siri out. I mean, but I think it's busted. And needs to be a new Siri. And if you've got a new Siri that's not as good as Chat GPT, but can leverage something like Chat GPT, great, great. So, boy, and and you know, it's not going to be there in the first developer beta, right? You know, mm-hmm. it's not going to be there. Mm-hmm. Something, something will be there, but it won't be there. So, a lot of this is going to hinge on like, what does Apple say? I, sorry to keep coming back to my classic Jason position of pay attention to the storytelling, but oh my god. We are going to have to pay close attention to the storytelling here because I suspect the storytelling will tell us more about what Apple's thinking about AI than maybe the initial betas will. So moving on from this, uh, we have some iPhone news. So a couple of things. First, the 16 line, this year's iPhones. Dummy models of the 16 Pro and 16 Pro Max have started appearing online. And if these are to be believed, the iPhones are getting a little bit bigger. The 16 Pro will go from 6.1 to 6.3 inches, and the 16 Pro Max will go from 6.7 to 6.9 inches. So Ooh. phones, they're getting a little bigger. And wow. with this increase, Ming-Chi Kuo is reporting that the 16 Pro Max may also benefit from new battery technology to give a bigger battery life boost to the oh. 16 Pro Max. Oh, nice. I like that. Well, that's you're a you're a a, a big phone boy. Mm-hmm. You like the are you are you sort of like you know, Pro Max is fine, or, or are you still in the camp of sort of like, I will take as much screen as you will throw at me. I don't know if I want it to get bigger. Ha <laughs> ha! Interesting. Interesting. I I feel like the Pro Max is at the limit that I want. I don't think I want more phone. Mm. Um, I would need more reason for bigger phone than just bigger screen now. Now, if it is like bigger battery, I'm like, great. You know, or like other features, like we were talking about them a couple of weeks ago, like the other features that they might add. And then I'll be like, okay, like, you know, and maybe this, maybe you remember we were talking about the fact that the 16 Pro might get the Tetra Prism lens. Maybe right. they needed to make the phone a little bit bigger to make that work. I don't know, but um, I'm not, sure i want the phone to get bigger and again it's just a small amount but in your pocket that's a bigger amount you know the way it feels so that was intriguing to me but maybe i'll only have to worry about it for one year because a report from jeff poo at the information details some of apple's plans for the iphone 17 line oh my god in 2026 (laughs) the biggest piece of news here is that the plus phone is going away. So they the fourth phone uh, in the lineup has once again failed. It's the curse of the of the iPhone mini. So ah. Apple is going in a completely new direction and working on something that that the information that Jeff is calling the iPhone 17 Slim. The Slim model would sit It's going to be s- air. It's going to sc- be air, Mike. It's going to be air. iPhone May- air. It's going to happen. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, le- Let's go through this first, and, and I'll say why okay. that doesn't necessarily land with me. All right. So the, this slim model would sit between the Pro and Pro Max in screen size. Now, mm-hmm. interestingly, Jeff's article references the 15s screen sizes, but then there's mm. these new rumors of the 16 making it bigger, so let's just say between for now. Okay. It would be significantly thinner than any other iPhone model, and would have a higher price tag than the Pro Max. Ooh. That's why the Air thing I'm not so sure about, because it will be I the mean, most expensive iPhone. Right. Because it will but be thin, but thin. super slim. Which could be quite luxurious mm-hmm. as an idea. Now, interestingly, this, this gets weirder to me. The 17, the 17 Slim, and the 17 Pro will be made from aluminium with a design that is, quote, more complex, whatever that means. 
and the Pro Max will retain titanium, and that phone will have a narrow dynamic island using a technology called MetaLens. And this new design in general, so that this new design that all of these phones will have, will feature rear cameras centered on the device rather than in the corner. Whoa. This is a really weird report. Like, there's so many (laughs) weird things in this. (laughs) This is so strange. The slim iPhone, middle size-wise, more expensive, made from aluminium, which is weird. Like, that's weird to me. I'm assuming the 16 Pro will be titanium. But I guess if they do have a new design, you could maybe, like re-talk about the the materials again, but then why does the Pro Max retain titanium? Maybe Mm -hmm. that phone's going to be different. Like, I guess it's going to look different on the front, so maybe it will have more than that. Um, I am on board with, let's try the fourth phone again, though. Like, I I think that that, to me, is a good idea. Because they're clearly struggling to land that. And I, I would say that smaller... Or bigger, but not the nice one. Neither of those are compelling enough stories, I think, for for a large amount of people. I think signif- like a really thin, beautiful iPhone, maybe that would be a, a USP of its own. Right. But then it's really weird for it not to have the most features, but it'd be more expensive. It's, a str- it'd be str- it's gonna be a strange lineup. Mm-hmm. Like that's for sure. Mm-hmm. If this all comes to pass, I like. From a marketing standpoint, like a marketplace standpoint, I like the idea. Like we tried the small phone, we tried the big phone, in the in the low end set. Mm-hmm. Why don't we try an ultra ultra premium phone, a luxury yeah. phone yeah. Ab- that's above the pros? What, why don't we go up there? Because I'm sure Apple feels like there are some buyers for whom money is essentially no object, and a beautiful iPhone that costs $2,000, but is super luxe and amazing and thin and feels like the future, is th- there There are people who will buy that, right? Yeah. There are people who will buy that. Maybe, maybe that yeah. is more, maybe being in that muddy middle as the fourth phone out of four <laughs> that's kind of different but not really is a loser because the, the, the pro has a clear selling point and the pro max has a clear selling point and the base model has a pretty clear selling point and then the the odd one out that's just differentiated by size seems to have not worked either time so go up scale mm-hmm. and shoot for something that's even that's like i mean it feels mike i really get iphone 10 vibes from this as well yes I like too. what if we made the future phone and it was really expensive but we just made it and sold it for a lot of money well but really expensive we could do it now beautiful Right, like and we, we make we yes. make almost a piece of jewelry and charge you a lot of money for it, which is kind of what right. the iPhone ten felt like at that yeah. time. The iPhone ten was like, oh my god, this is not like any other phone. It costs what? But mm-hmm. it was so different and felt like the future. And I could see them selling a, a an expensive iPhone model that felt like the future. That was not a, a Pro or a Pro Max. It was a different thing. It was a different size different thinness, different weight, maybe has some other different technology things on it. I could, I, I, I mean, they've got all sorts of market research and stuff, but just as a person on the outside hearing this idea, I can see why this idea might be worth trying Yeah, because you might find many more available buyers up there. I think that's been one of the Apple's lessons, right? Is that Apple has learned to reach people who have smaller budgets for phones with older models and with the SE and and they have had success with that. But I mean, I would assume the Pro Max has taught them that there are some people for whom um the the price doesn't matter yeah. and they just want the best biggest best iPhone. I think for and, Apple as a yeah. business, it makes the most sense to have totally. four distinct models, two of them are very expensive. Like I just yeah. think that it makes sense to them. I, th- like, I mean, they may learn that there is a limit to that, or the mm-hmm. product might not uh, tick the boxes. But I, I just I'm trying to imagine a buyer who does not care so much about the money, but really wants a, a gorgeous, amazing, talked about phone. And this is, I mean, honestly, Mike, when we talk about Apple's phone sales over time, it's often this kind of phone that spurs sales. 
yeah. around the world. Yeah. Not just China, but China's one place where where you could get a great advantage here, but around the world. Um if there's an appreciably different new looking iPhone and it costs there are a lot of people who just buy it cuz they don't care. Like uh, there are a lot of people who it's like, you know, yeah. okay, it's it's $2000, whatever. Like they don't care. Mm-hmm. They, what they want is the you know, and for those of us who are cheapskates and are like, oh, man, I'm gonna, you know, the fact is, Apple has an audience that contains a lot of people who just want the amazing, coolest, uh, greatest looking Apple product. And so, yeah, I would, if I was at Apple, I would try this for sure, right? Because this this may be a an untapped market. It's that classic like, whatever your most expensive product is, there are some people in your audience who would have paid even more. Mm-hmm. And are there enough of them for you to make a product for them? And something like this sounds like exactly that. And I hope we get four distinct names. So like the Pro Max becomes Ultra and then this gets its own name. And then we have like the iPhone 17, that would the be iPhone nice. 17 Pro, the iPhone 17, we'll call it Slim, and the iPhone 17 Ultra. Especially because if they're differentiating the Pro Max with something yes. like titanium and things like that. And like it's it, it, look it really different. is a different phone. Yeah. yeah, it's a different phone. I mean, it's been that way for a while anyway, and it seems like they're going further in that direction. And I just think as a someone who is interested in just talking about these things, four distinct iPhones that fit four different markets feels more intriguing to me than we're going to take the line, split it in half, kind of replicate the two, and they're going to have different features. Like... The, the plus got lost. I forget it exists most of the time. Yeah. Um, and clearly the mini did not sell what they needed. Otherwise, it'd still make it. So I think this is a very interesting idea. The other way to go would be you have a 17. Again, keep in mind, we're talking about 2025 here. <laughs> it's 16 months away. Uh, 17, 17 Pro, 17 Pro Max, and 17 Ultra. And the new phone is the Ultra. Maybe? Maybe, yeah. So yeah, but you see, I, I mean, air. I just too, think about the thinness, and I sell it that. But if it's expensive, ultra but, to and me super feels luxe, like it needs ultra. to have all of the features, right? Like all of them, and it's not going yeah. to, right? So, going to be really intriguing to see if they do this and how they pull it off. And the rest of this, like a center camera and stuff like that. I mean, it's just weird. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. We know that they work in advance and that often these weird rumors from the summer before, like the previous year, do end up being right. Mm-hmm. But, and sometimes it's the details. Remember, I'll, I'll remember iPhone math. <laughs> sometimes the details are not quite iPhone right. Math. Yeah, I don't the think Slim math. is the name. I, I really don't think um, Slim is the name. But it's really interesting to think about. And I, I think, I mean, look, Apple spent the last, what, five, six, seven years, super, I mean, really 10 years since they did the larger phone for the first time, experimenting with the with iPhone sales dynamics. Mm-hmm. It's their most important product. It's more than half of their total company revenue. Um, and they've had some success in differentiating the product line, but clearly there's this one model that has not, they they feel like they haven't cracked it. So I think they're absolutely going to continue experimenting here and finding what the market wants. And if they have the capability to make this, I think that's the most interesting thing about this rumor, honestly, is it it sounds like it comes out of a question of like, we could make a phone that's appreciably different next generation phone that's thinner, but it'll have some compromises and where does it fit? And we don't really want, and it'll be expensive to make. And 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 then out of that emerges, well, why don't we just make that future phone and people will buy it because it's awesome, even though it's super expensive. That's an interesting idea. So the experiments continue. And finally, Mark Gurman is reporting that the Mac Studio and Mac Pro will not receive an update until mid-2025. All yeah. other Macs should be on the M4 generation by the end of 2024. Based on some of his previous reports, where he said that there was another chip that had not debuted yet, Mm-hmm. In the M3 line, it sounds like they were originally at some point planning to do an M3 Studio and Pro, and then with the move to the M4, they've just decided they not stopped. to do that. And they're essentially skipping. That's fine. It seems like it's fine. It's fine. I'll, Honestly, I'll keep waiting. I'm going to keep if, waiting. I am not if, buying a computer until <laughs> until the next Mac Studio <laughs> becomes available. Well, right. I have an M1 Max Mac Studio, right? And I felt I thought about it like. If I was given the opportunity to buy an M3 Max, Mac Studio, knowing what I know about the M4, would I? I wouldn't. 
Yeah, probably not. <laughs> yeah, probably I not. I'll probably keep waiting. I'll probably so keep waiting. it's probably all for the best. Because for me, all I really want it for is just to simplify, like, and not be using a laptop, not be using a Thunderbolt dock anymore. I want all my I.O. in the one machine and then to take additional power. What I don't yeah. need this computer really to have is more power. Like, I'm using an M1 Pro MacBook Pro. Sure. I can happily use this for another year and a half. And actually, I will be happier Same. to do that because I'll get more use out of this yeah. computer. My, my M1 Max Mac Mini is great. It's great. It's fine. I, I can I can foresee a moment where I'm going to want a new one, mm -hmm. and I'm not really there yet. And knowing that the M4 generation has begun, this would not be the time that I would look to leap, right? Because I'm like, well, you know, I don't really need that power right now. And I know the new chip generation is very impressive because we've already started it. So I think, and I think there are a lot of buyers who would be like that, where it's just like, it's just fine. Let's just not even bother putting those products out and we'll wait until hopefully early next year. But um, for the, and that's the Mac Studio, the Mac Pro and the MacBook Air, mm -hmm. not until 2025. Uh, no, the Mark said all other Macs should be by yeah, the Yeah, but then, then he says the Mac, except the MacBook Air. He threw the MacBook oh, Air in there. I'm sorry, I misread that. Thank you. Although I, I find that weird and maybe it's a chip volume thing, but mm -hmm. like, I don't know, you're shipping an M4 iPad. Wouldn't you want to ship an M4 MacBook Air sooner rather than later? Mm. But it may just be a, a sheer volume thing that they just can't have. They won't have enough because they know how many MacBook Airs sell <laughs> and they won't have enough for that product. And so they're going to wait until next year. But um, that, I, I, yeah, I, I find that a little surprising, but that's that's where they are. The the Air, in my opinion, the Air should be the first Mac to, to, to get a new chip of a new generation. But I also get that it's the best-selling one, and well, that remind me, is this the basis of the iPhone chip too? Like I forget how this works now. The this so the the M4 isn't, but the the presumably there will be an iPhone chip that will be on this process, okay. the new TSMC process, which will take volume. Right. Yes. The, presumably, the, there is volume that they are putting on the iPhone because they need those chips. And that won't be called an M. It will be called an A. But uh, and it might have, you know, I assume it'll have the CPU cores and the GPU cores from the M4. I assume that, that, it, that it will use a lot of the same work as the M4, but they, they tend to call it something else because they make it for the phone. So it's more power efficient, et cetera, et cetera. But like it's going to be the same process, presumably. And so that factors in too, right? They got to make a lot of chips for the iPhone for this mm. fall. A lot of them. Yeah, maybe the iPhones and the iPads are enough that you wouldn't want to have the MacBook Air at the same time. Like maybe it's a, I mean, maybe it's too much. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I seriously think there's a spreadsheet somewhere because I'm sure, look, I'm sure they would make the MacBook Air the first M series yeah. uh, Mac, right? If they could. There's got to be a spreadsheet somewhere of TSMC capacity and reserved for the iPhone. Yep. And reserved for this M4 chip that they're putting in lower volume products like the iPad Pro and probably some other low volume Macs mm -hmm. as we get to the fall. Yep. And they've got the, they want to do the Pro and Max variants for the MacBook Pro and put them out there. And, you know, you, you start to look at it and you think, you know, we just revved the MacBook Air. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Like, I literally still have my review units on my desk. I haven't put them in the boxes yet to send them back to Apple. Like, they just came out. <laughs> So I can see somebody inside Apple say, you know, it's fine. And and the truth is, those of us who are super wired into Apple stuff know about the M4 and care about it. But I think Apple probably also knows that, that the existence of the M4 iPad Air probably not going to hurt MacBook Air sales, really. Not that much. It's it's fine. You know, I, would, I saw this one other headline today. I just think it's hilarious uh, from uh, Mac Rumors. Apple's chief operating officer, Jeff Williams, has visited Taiwan to secure supply of TSMC's upcoming two nanometer chips. <laughs> Economic <laughs> Daily News reports the visit apparently involved a meeting between Williams and TSMC's president to discuss custom AI chips and ensure that Apple will be able to access the chip maker's two nanometer manufacturing process set to begin in 2025. <laughs> I saw someone, I wish I remember yep. who it was now. It was either on Threads or on Mastodon saying, has anybody from this team slept in the last five years? <laughs> Unbelievable. 
really unbelievable. It just it just keeps going. I mean, that's that's what I, I've said this before, but like one of the things that I'm impressed by about Apple people, especially on the non-marketing side, on the technical side, is they have to talk when a product launches. They are talking about the past. They probably have to be reminded of what they did, right? Like when Johnny Sruji appears and he's like, hey, new chip, yay. Like that chip is old news. That chip yeah. is a work he did three, four years ago. It's old stuff. They're on to the next one, right? Like we're all like, whoa, three nanometer process. Mm. It's like, no, no, Jeff Williams is talking to TSMC about their two nanometer process. They're already thinking about the chip that they're going to use in 25 or 26. Like they're they're on to the next one already. Yep. So that was Ben McCarthy's joke, who said, "I get the impression no one on Apple's chip design team has taken a day off in about five years." That was the, yeah, that was the joke, and I wholeheartedly endorse that idea. Yeah, so bring on the. I mean, the, and and for people who are like, well, I mean, what happens after the the nanometer like runs out? We we we're, we're are there no like? There's only two left, and then what? And all the answer is, don't worry. Uh, then we recalibrate the scale, and we start talking about picometers mm -hmm. <laughs> hooray <laughs> so get ready for that that'll be something uh yeah mm -hmm. this episode is brought to you by our friends at uni pizza ovens uni is the world's number one pizza oven company letting you make restaurant quality pizza in your own home uni pizza ovens can reach up to 950 degrees fahrenheit and cook pizza in as little as 60 seconds the high temperature that you get in an uni pizza oven is what will make your pizza stand out from what you could make in a conventional home oven. They're incredibly quick to heat up. You'll be ready to go in just 20 minutes, which is enough time to get your dough and your toppings ready. Whether you love authentic wood-fired flavor, the convenience of cooking with gas, or wherever you want to cook with wood, it doesn't matter. Wood, charcoal, gas, even electricity, there is an uni oven that fits your needs and lifestyle. Uni has designed ovens like the wood pellet fueled Fire 12 and the multi-fueled Karu 12G for maximum portability. They're made for people who like to cook on the go, maybe camping, getting out into the wilderness, and still having wonderful food. But if you want the convenience of gas but love the flavor of wood fired cooking too, Uni's Karu line has you covered because you have the flexibility of choosing wood charcoal right out of the box, and you can even get the optional gas burner as well. And if you're like me, you may be interested in the Uni Electric Vault 12 pizza oven, which lets you make pizza both indoors and outdoors. I was blown away by how easy it is and how convenient it is to make pizza in the Uni Vault. It just goes onto our kitchen island countertop, and we're able to cook pizza, and then we can just put it in a cupboard under the stairs in the little bag that it comes in. Like, incredible. Like I love how easy it is to cook pizza in the Vault 12 and how fantastic and tasty this pizza is and how simple they make it. Uni will have uh, loads. They have a great app which has a bunch of tips and recipes. If you want to get some help, uh, we watched a bunch of videos on their YouTube channel. They have tons of great content to help you get started. We even bought our groceries for the pizza that we wanted to make on the Uni website. It's like, why not just let them do all the work for us? I even make dough that you can buy too. Uh, but uni ovens are for more than just pizza. You can cook juicy burgers, sizzling fajitas, buffalo wings, and so much more. Their ovens start at just $299 with free shipping to the US, UK, and EU. And they also make cast iron cookware, pizza peels, thermometers, and tons of other accessories. Listeners of this show can get 10% off their purchase of an uni pizza oven. Just go to uni.com, that's O-O-N-I.com, and use the code UPGRADE2024 at checkout. Uni pizza ovens are the best way to bring restaurant quality pizza to your own home. Just go to O-O-N-I, uni.com, and use the code UPGRADE2024 for 10% off. Our thanks to uni pizza ovens for their support of this show and Relay FM. So I got an iPad Pro. Yay! Uh, I picked it up over the weekend. I got the 11 inch Ooh. model. Uh, it's good. And I wanted it's good. To talk about my experience with this a little bit. Um, oh, yes, please. It's, it's going to be different to some of the other conversation about good. the iPad Pro. Good. Like, good. I, 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 I sent you a text, uh, yes. you and Steven, a Slack message where I said, you know what? I think I'm iPad discoursed out. I. Mm -hmm. I we had a really good episode of MacBreak Weekly last week okay. um, in studio, me and Micah, along with Leo, and then Andy remotely. And I think we had and we had new iPad Pros there, and I think we had a really good discussion. I was very happy with the sort of points that I made on that. And then I came back home, and I was exhausted. And uh, and I said to you guys, I think I'm discoursed out about the iPad Pro. I think I'm done. I think I have said every word 
and probably several more than that that I have to say about uh, working on an iPad, et cetera, et cetera. And I would like to, um, re, you know, go back into the into the bushes like Homer Simpson. So I I love hearing you want to take this from another angle. It's yeah. beautiful. Because like, I understand where this comes from. And I have gone through my own journey. You know, like I was in the camp of you and Federico of really trying to do work on my iPad Pro, like use it as my laptop. And I did for a long time. But then a combination of workplace changes. So when I got my studio and Apple Silicon kind of changed it. And then I just moved back to the Mac. Since then, I've mostly focused my iPad usage on watching video, playing games, browsing the web, like communication, you know, like iMessage and Slack, but not like we're really getting into stuff, not a ton of work really, and reading comics. And I've gotten by great in the past couple of years using an iPad mini, but I have been basically since the beginning frustrated with the quality of the screen on the iPad mini. And I was really interested in this iPad Pro for my iPad needs because I think for all of those things, video, gaming, web browsing, like using it as my kind of like home computer, which is just like mostly things for me, not things for work and reading comics, I thought that the iPad Pro would do a great job. And the the decrease in weight and thickness would maybe make it not so much of a thing going from the mini to the 11 inch. So it is incredibly thin and light. Um, it's very funny to me that it's thinner than my iPad Mini. Like it, it, I know this, but also it's funny anyway. Like it's just like a weird thing. Um, I'm still getting used to the screen size. It feels massive <laughs> to me for an iPad because I have been so used to now using an iPad Mini. This the 11 inch iPad Pro feels monstrously large. It's it's very strange how you kind of like accustomed to that. But the thing that I am happiest about is the screen. This screen is incredible. It's so good. The OLED, like, I uh, watched X-Men 97 on my iPad, right? And, like, it's just a cartoon. Fantastic cartoon. Oh, my God, by the way. Oh, my God. Could not recommend X-Men 97 enough. Incredible. Uh, but I, I pressed play, and a trailer for the Indiana Jones movie started up. And it was in, like, Dolby Vision. I couldn't believe yeah. it. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it was uh, like my, I could not believe how good it looked. I was blown away by it. Like, cause it's, you know, the OLED, like I think one of the first scenes is like, they're in like a, it's like a dark street, but there's like a neon sign. Oh my God. It looked incredible. Uh, and so, yeah, screens were all good. <laughs> like OLED in general is great. And you mentioned this last time and I don't, even hearing you say, it, I don't think I was prepared for the idea of like, Everything about iPad OS looks better with an OLED screen. Everything. Right. It's not just right video. Thing. Everything. Yeah, like little panels come up and you're like, whoa, that's very bright. <laughs> yeah. Or just like the color, like the richness yeah. of the color yeah, feels better. Totally. Like just looking at my home screen just is so well, much And you're coming nicer. from the mini, right? Like yeah. I, I, I found it a little more subtle, but I'm coming from the best iPad screen ever made, which was yes. the 12.9 with the mini LED backlighting and the 2,500 different dimming zones. But if you're not coming from that one, then it's just that much more stark yes. of a difference. Massively different. Massively different. Um, like, yeah, the mini screen is not good. Uh, like, it has the jelly scrolling issue where you kind of like sometimes scroll and it looks like the two halves of the screen are scrolling at a different refresh rate, which is really weird. So, but you know, I'm also, I have ProMotion again on an iPad where it's really noticeable on the iPad. I feel like it, it, it works very well on that screen. And I've, I've had iPad Pros before, but it's been a long time for me, right? And so, but yeah, I skipped them. My last iPad Pro was the 2020 iPad Pro. So like I didn't get any of those, like the mini LED changes and all that kind of stuff. Um, I had forgotten how good Face ID is for an iPad. Um, but it's not better than Touch ID in every scenario for me. So when I'm using the iPad, I much prefer it for, like, you know, authenticating uh, one password, all that kind of stuff. But unlocking an iPad Pro isn't as nice, in my opinion, as unlocking the iPad Mini was because... If you have a keyboard attached, you just tap a key and it unlocks for you. But if you don't have a keyboard attached, 
you pick it up, wake the screen, and then have to swipe it. Or whatever. Right. Right. Where like with the iPad mini, I would unlock it by like I'd touching. wake up the screen by by touching the same button that also would read my fingerprint and unlock the iPad. When now I'm more like, oh, I pick it up, I tap the screen to wake it, and then I'm like, oh, now I swipe up. It's like it's just, it's not as smooth an experience where I remember with having the keyboard, you just like tap the space bar and the iPad would unlock because I don't have a magic keyboard and I have no desire to get one. Like it could not be further away from what I want my iPad to do. And like, I don't want to add the weight and the bulk for a keyboard that I'm trying not to use really. Because I don't want to make this like a big work device for me. Um, so I am using the uh, Magic Folio, the 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 denim color because it's the only color. Uh, it has new magnet positions, which is nice. It's a little more fiddly, but you basically have like a much more, you have more adjustability in the angles, so it can be fiddly to get there. But I like it. Like I like that I can lean it back a little bit more or have it kind of standing up straight a little bit more. I think that's it's cool that they added that. So I, I like that they did that, and it isn't just all about uh, getting the keyboard and that's your only adjustability option. Like I, th- I think that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, the, the I do really like Face ID though. Like having that back again on the iPad is just nice. I I kind of forgotten how comfortable that is. I have had a couple of times similar to you where um I'm I'm holding I'm holding it in such a way that I'm covering the sensors. But they deal with that yeah. pretty well. Yeah, I found that my uh my usual horizontal holding is up is upside down from where they put the camera. So I have to retrain huh. myself to hold it the other way. Mostly because I, I preferred to have the back of the folio case hang down. And attach yep. and not have it be upside down where if it's not perfectly attached, it falls over. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. a different feel, and I preferred it, but now I just have to train myself out of it because the, there's nothing worse than opening it up and being like, oh, I can't do your face ID, and I realize, oh, yeah, it's all the way down at the bottom, and my my shirt is covering it or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm like, i got to flip it back over. Um, Coming from the mini, uh, I am... I cannot stop noticing how fast and smooth everything is. I expect this is a combination of both the M4 and the Pro- and ProMotion, but everything is moving faster, better. You know, I am getting a sense of like this is a very powerful computer. Like I, I feel like I have that in my. You know, it's very. I can feel the power in it. Um, also, having a pencil attached to the iPad again. Obviously, I did not do that with my iPad Mini um, because one, the pencil is really big compared to the Mini, and two. I wouldn't ever really feel myself wanting to use it on that screen because it was so small. Um, but I'm very happy to have the Apple Pencil and iPad Pro back for product design stuff. Um, I, there are many times I've borrowed my wife's iPad to sit and draw something out for like a new Cortex brand notepad or something. Like I would draw it out because I just find that to be a nice experience and I'm happy to have something that's back to being mine again for that. And the Apple Pencil Pro is an incredible upgrade. Um, the haptics feeling are fantastic. The squeeze gesture to bring up the little palette is brilliant. Um, I'm really intrigued to see more apps like and what they're going to do with the haptic stuff. Um, I, I, and it's nice to have that again. I think if you use uh, an Apple Pencil a lot, like if you're an illustrator or an artist, there is, I think, enough in here that you would want to upgrade for it. Um, I, I think it is a significantly better experience to be able to access tools like right where you are also this is the first time i've had hover apple pencil hover oh yeah that's really cool um like i i like when i've been using the like for me the majority of my usage um has always been interface stuff right that that was Mm -hmm. i was a big proponent of that it's really nice to have the little indicator where wherever i'm hovering over like if i was using the trackpad or whatever I, i like that a lot um, so yeah, I'm super happy with this iPad. I, I feel very confident in saying if you have a 2018 or 2020 iPad Pro, this is the update you've been waiting for. Like you should upgrade to this one. Like if you use an iPad Pro and you have like that first redesign model and you use it f- regularly, I think if you move to this, you will be very happy with the upgrade because mm-hmm. I think this is a significant upgrade, especially the screen. I mean, that's what an iPad is, right? It's the screen, and this screen is bananas good. Like, it's so good. Everything looks fantastic on it. And if you watch stuff that is like, 
you know, Dolby Vision, like HDR, incredible. Looking at pictures on yep. this thing, incredible. Videos, yep. incredible, right? Because it's all the smart HDR stuff. Yeah, th- it's this is a fantastic iPad. I love it. I love it. Um, I don't think I'm going to use my Mini anymore. I, I was I, wondering, I, right? Like, will I still use I was use worried the mini? about your Mini, right? I was like, uh, is he going to be disappointed with the size of this thing because the Mini yeah. is is so wonderfully small, yeah. but you lose all those features? Because, you know, for me, I was still wondering, like, oh, I'd still use the Mini to read comics because it's so small and nice to hold in bed. But no, 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 the, scr- no, no, the OLED screen. is too good. It's too good. Uh, yeah. So, I yeah, th- I'm pretty sure... The mini will be visiting a farm upstate at some point mm. soon, uh, because Good. this thing is I I love it. It's like for everything I want to use my iPad for, it is better at all of those things significantly. This is a really really good device, and yet the thinness and lightness of it is fantastic. Like it, it this is it's wild that, that they built a device that's like this. Um, it's a real flex, and also they don't flex, <laughs> which is that's been the thing, right? There's been that's a so lot of bend tests now, no, uh, no and bend gate. it's it's holding up. So bravo, Apple! Yep. I think this is a great uh, iPad. Yeah, I wanted to say again that about uh, one of the things I've appreciated about the pencil is the haptics are really well done, right? That we we've talked about how I know I mentioned this last week. We've talked about how the pencil is in some ways like the ultimate Apple product because it feels like it, it doesn't have technology in it at all. It's actually stuffed full of it, and that video showed like flying through the barrel of the pencil and all that. But from the outside, it it might as well be a piece of wood. It is. There's nothing there, mm-hmm. uh, and the haptics are also tastefully done. Where you know they say the haptics up in the top of the barrel, but you wouldn't know. Like the effect is incredibly uh, solid and strong, and then that squeeze gesture, which I find just so much more natural than the double tap, which is still there, right? You can still do double tap, but the squeeze gesture, I feel like, is more purposeful. I feel comfortable making the squeeze gesture in a way that I did not with the double tap. I can kind of keep it in my hand and squeeze versus the double tap where I have to change my grip. I think it's better. And although anybody can write their uh, to the API to handle the squeeze gesture how they want, I I just want to say again how impressed I am with the undo that they built the radial undo, because one of the challenges in iOS for ages has been, how do you do undo on a device that doesn't have a keyboard so you can't do Command Z? And it's been like, you can shake it, or you can make a finger gesture. But the undo with the squeeze gesture brings up a ring, and you can trace backward and watch your drawing, let's say, go backward, and then trace it back forward. How do you You do that? So you, you go, you squeeze... Yeah. On anything that's doing pencil kit, and there'll be an undo item, and you yeah. select the undo item, and then it turns into an undo ring, and then you just move your pencil along the ring, and it will step backward or forward. It's basically an undo history like oh. you'd see in Photoshop or something, and you can you can find the state of undo. Instead of going back, 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 no, forward, 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 back, that one, you just you just trace it. And you have to like it's tap and amazing. hold on it a little, right? So you like select it, you like just press on it, and then you get oh, and it's got a little hat tick on each notch. That's yeah. sick. That is it's sick. really good. So wow. that that was my that's that's my uh, my sleeper pick. I forgot about that. Like my that. favorite feature is whoever came up with the the radial pencil undo. Not only is it super smart, I gotta say. It should probably be system wide without the pencil. I I would much rather be able to do like a a, a three finger tap or a double tap or a triple tap to bring up a ring that oh would let God, me just you could do just a keep going a, forever. Uh, wow, uh-huh. what a feature! Yeah, that's good stuff. That's yeah, good stuff. That's so cool, thumbs man. up to the to the pencil people. I know it doesn't. It's like oh, it's just the pencil and it's a little nicer and all that. And the barrel roll. People are going to experiment with the barrel roll to do different things. Like I, I keep waiting. I imagine Ferrite will at some point let you barrel roll to like change a because the, all the audio settings are like knobs to like just change the balance by maybe even hovering over a, a control and then just turning the pencil right. Mm-hmm. Like uh, yeah, there's it's it's a uh, it's not for everybody. Everybody's got their own use cases. But wow, for what it is. And its audience, it was it's really perfectly implemented the whole the ho- hardware and software of the Pencil Pro. Yeah, I you know 
my wife is an illustrator and we've been talking about this and I showed her the new stuff and she was really she thought it was really cool and she watched the event and was really impressed by it. she's a procreate user um, and she was really impressed by what they were showing but that's not available yet like they've they've, they've updated it to support the new pencil but they've not right. given their like big update that's coming um, and so I think our plan is when it when it comes out she's going to try it and we'll probably trade in her old iPad and get her a new one because for her the the um I think the thing that they showed about being able to select layers is like massively, massively excellent. Oh like, yeah, to right. Do the, the layer selection on an item like right. really, really, really would make a huge difference to, for anyone the, creating art. The goal is, and I know people don't understand this um, because when I talk about keyboard shortcuts, uh, like back with the media controls before there was a function around the Magic Keyboard, people were like, "Well, just reach up and like I don't want to reach up. My hands on the keyboard. When my hands on the keyboard, I want to keep it on the keyboard." I'm in keyboard mode. The last thing I want to do is break out of keyboard mode, go fiddle around. Like, I just want to hit the key and then go back to what I'm doing, right? That's what I want. With the pencil, it's the exact same thing, which is if you can build interfaces and gestures and things into the pencil so that there's more you can do while you're working with the pencil that doesn't require you to put down the pencil, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, selecting is a great example of that. Undoing is a great example of that. Being able to do that squeeze and then pick another item from a palette and go somewhere else is a great way to keep you engaged in holding the pencil instead of having to set it down. Because, I mean, I run into that in Ferrite every now and then where I have to do something like a... And you could go through the interface with it too, but like, I don't know, for me, I end up going, I'm just going to set the pencil down because I'm tapping through the interface. I don't, unlike you, I don't love tapping through the interface with the pencil. I'd really rather just kind of like get to the thing mm -hmm. really quickly and then be be back with my job. But when you do that, you've broken concentration. I think when you go into the UI, so to have it all be kind of triggered from the pencil, it's just, it unlocks, I, I think, more creativity because you're not breaking stride. Uh, you're able to continue your focus. Your hand is in, you know, it's on the pencil. It's in the right place. You're doing the right thing there. So, yeah, two thumbs up from me. Nice. Like, I understand the frustration that everybody has. I also want iPad OS to be better. But for me, iPad OS is doing a great job at what I want it to do right yeah. now. And I'm happy sure. with where this tool fits within my lineup of products that I use. Yeah. For all of our conversations about this, I, what I don't want to get lost is there are lots of amazing iPad use cases, and everybody's got a everybody's got their own. But I I I don't have a lot of time for people who are like, eh, the iPad, it's irrelevant. Like, if that's okay, that's fine. But just because it's irrelevant for you, it doesn't mean it's irrelevant for other people. That I mm -hmm. I think like it. I don't know if it's my most used Apple device because I sit at my Mac all day. But like everywhere else, I'm. In the on the, in in bed in the morning before I go to bed, uh, sitting on the couch watching TV, like uh, cooking in the kitchen, like that's all iPad. It's all iPad for me. I, I I have found so many places where it fits better in my life than a laptop or a phone, and I'm very happy about it. Not not everybody's like that. That's fine, but there are so many great use cases. So it's great to hear you talk about yours. There are lots of we we. There are lots of reasons to be critical about the way that Apple has acted as a shepherd for iPad OS as a, as as the developer of iPad OS and not taking it places that it perhaps should go given the, some of the hardware that they're building but that doesn't change the fact that it's still a remarkable product in a lot of ways and in fact one of the reasons people are motivated to criticize it is because they like it and they want it to be even better so anyway lots of great places where you can use an iPad I'm glad it, I really wasn't sure that you would convert from the iPad mini because the mini is so delightfully Same. small, yep. but there's so many other things about these other iPads that are great. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was, I wanted to try and yes, I mean, what it has kind of uh, reminded me is first and foremost, I love new technology <laughs> and yeah. this has new technology, like a lot of new technology in it. Um, and I'm, I am enamored with it really. Hmm. This episode is brought to you by Wild Grain. Wild Grain is the first ever Bake From Frozen subscription box for sourdough breads, fresh pastas, and artisanal pastries. Every item bakes from frozen in 25 minutes or less. No thawing required. Jason, it's around dinner time for me right now. Can you make me oh. pretty hungry by talking about yes. Wild Grain? <laughs> last night, Mike. Last night. Mm. 
what do we do? We were ma- we're like, okay, what what what's dinner gonna be? And we had a bunch of uh, ideas, and I said, you know, let's do. There's an instant pot recipe that I like. That's um for miserwat. It's a uh, Ethiopian um lentils dish. Mm-hmm. It's a little spicy. It's really nice. Mm-hmm. And they usually have it uh, traditionally in Ethiopia with bread or with injera, which is their bread. And I thought, you know, we've got another wild grain bread in the freezer. And so I made the miser wat in the Instant Pot. I uh, turned on the oven. I took the loaf of, I think it was like a cheesy sourdough or something out of the freezer, put it in the... uh, uh, in the oven, uh, you know, let it let it do its baking thing. Took it out, let it do its cooling thing. Sliced it up, and we had this great lentil dish, um, and uh, fresh bread. I just sliced all the bread and put it on a plate, and I just sat there with my bowl, <laughs> just dipping the bread in and eating the spicy lentil dish. It's like lentils and ginger and garlic and onion and it's and then it, it it ends up being really smooth because it's it's pressure cooked mm-hmm. into oblivion so it's just this very nice stew and then you just put it on the bread and you eat it it's so good it's so good but the fresh bread was the thing i said i don't want to make this unless i've got the fresh bread and even though it came from the freezer it it comes out you bake it and you bake it like you made it from dough but it's actually just in the freezer and it reaches that point where it is indistinguishable in my opinion from completely fresh baked from dough bread because i don't know when they're freezing it in the process i don't know how they do their magic so anyway that was magic. amazing one of our other choices was pasta because they they also have frozen pasta that's fresh pasta like you uh, not like the the dried stuff it's like the super soft wonderful fresh pasta uh, that was another option for us last night i was really into the wild grain last night not knowing that it was a sponsor today so that's hilarious anyway we had a great dinner and at the end lauren said did we eat that whole loaf of bread and i said yes we did (laughs) proudly because it's never as good as it is when it's fresh so how do you get fresh bread at home you know this was a great way we didn't have fresh bread in the house but we did because we had that wild grain in the freezer yeah, you successfully did it. You made me hungry. Uh, and now you listening, you can fully customize your wild grain box so you can get any combination of breads, pastas, and pastries that you like. If you want a box of all bread, all pasta, all pastry, you can have it. Plus, for a limited time, you can get $30 off your first box, plus free croissants in every box when you go to wildgrain.com slash upgrade to start your subscription. That is free croissants in every box box and $30 off your first box an incredible deal when you go to wildgrain.com slash upgrade that is w-i-l-d g-r-a-i-n dot com slash upgrade or you can use the promo code upgrade at checkout our thanks to wild grain for their support of this show and relay fm it is time for some ask upgrade questions how did you feel about steven doing the lasers uh, well, I couldn't hear him when he did them, mm-hmm. but we put them back in later, and right. uh, they're fine. They're fine. It was good that he did them. I thought that was fun. I was. I wondered if there was going to be a laser war of some kind. Maybe you were going to fire. Oh back. yeah. Well, I mean, if I could have heard them myself, but right. they were. We had to change it in the edit because it was. It was just like he's got. There's something about his office setup where he's got the really really aggressive. Um, noise canceling where you can't hear his yeah. bell dinging. We have this you all the time. You can't hear him going. It's just a problem. Steven has stealth lasers. Yeah. Dave asks, when you take your iPad off of your magic keyboard, do you put it in a case to carry it around? There are times where I'm running around when I want the iPad, but not the keyboard. What do you do, Jason? I mostly have, at all times, a smart folio cover as well as a magic keyboard. Okay. And I use the magic keyboard... I found a lot of people expect that you keep the iPad and the Magic Keyboard all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't. Oh, I use you tactically I, deploy I, it. I I do. I do. You know, I love a tactical deployment, Mike. <laughs> that is my. I, we love it here on the, on the upgrade program. We love a tactical deployment. <laughs> do we? Okay. We do. We do. We love okay. it. I love it when things are deployed tactically. Okay. When there's a deployment that happens, and you're like, you know what? That's it a must tactic be tactical. That happened there. If that it's was not tactical, I don't want it. 
No, exactly right. If it, not, not if it's like a big highfalutin kind of like theoretical deployment. I want it to be uh, tied to a tactic. Anyway, we love a tactical deployment, uh, and that's what I do. So I keep my iPad most of the time in the in the uh, smart folio. Most of the time. Though occasionally with this new one, I've been taking it out of the smart folio every now and then and been like, but it's now so thin and light, right? But mostly it's in the smart folio. If I'm going to be using it in extended time, I might take it off, but mostly yeah. it just stays in the smart folio. The keyboard, it just hangs around until I need to write something or type something that's of length, and then I will put it on. But I don't because I want it to be lighter. I mean, that, that's the thing when I say that the problem with the MacBook is that you can't rip the screen off and go, you know, use it. Uh, that's why is because most of the time I don't need the keyboard. And so I don't want the weight. And the beauty of it is it's just the keyboards around and I will, I'm like, oh, I'm going to write something on the iPad now and I will go find my keyboard and I'll snap it in and then I'll write my thing. But I don't, I don't have it hanging around all the time. I'm in the, in the smart folio cover, which I'll just say again, Apple has decided in their great wisdom to only make, they made one cover, one color for the cover. Whereas uh, when the old iPad Pro came out for the longest time, you only could get it in gray and then maybe I think gray and white. Uh, they finally made like some beautiful colors. I have an orange smart folio for my my M1 iPad Pro. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. They have denim <laughs> as the only color option other than even... gray and white. It, what I'll tell you is whatever you think denim is, it ain't that. Like no. this isn't denim. It's it doesn't like look a, like denim. It's, it's like a navy blue. I wouldn't even call it navy blue. It's like it's a it's blue. I don't know how to it's, describe it, but it's I dark wouldn't blue. think of it as denim. But yeah, it's like a no. kind of mute blue. Well, you know, jeans come in all sorts of blue jeans come in all sorts of colors, <laughs> including dark colors color, like this. But I hmm. think, like, I think whatever yeah. you think of as like your standard Levi's five hundred one blue jean or whatever, which is canonically denim, I suppose. Yeah, it's not, this. It's not like that. It's not that color at all. It's a yeah, lot darker. I than that. I use I keep. Obviously, I said earlier, I don't, I don't, I don't have a smart keyboard. I, I do magic keyboard, whatever it's called. I do kind of wish I could live the no case life for the iPad, but like for me, the case is very important to the functionality of the iPad. Like, I, agree. I want my iPad to stand. Yes. Like, that is very important to me. Um, yes. And I don't really, I don't, I don't screw with kickstands. I'm not a kickstand guy. No, kickstands are bad. Mm -hmm. Thumbs down for kickstands. So, Yes, I, I the the case is great, and I use it in all sorts of ways to yeah to put it upright to have it be in sort of typing position. There are lots of ways uh, that that it works better. Uh, I just wish that I wish the there were some color options. They're not going to give me color options for my iPad. I wish there were color options for the 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 cases, and I'm I'm just disappointed that that denim is the best we managed this time mm -hmm. after that because I want that orange again. The orange is so good, or or a yellow, or a or a, a, you know, something brighter would be really nice. And they did. Mm -hmm. There was like that brief moment where they're like, "Yeah, you could do a bright cover for an iPad Pro." And then they got, then there was the crackdown. Right, the colors are came back from vacation. It was like, "What are we doing here?" And then back in back in lockdown. I have another uh, similar question in the same vein from Neil, who says, "I am a caseless iPad user." as I appreciate the svelte dimensions of a bare device. Mm. So I often wonder what the use case is for a relatively case, bulky mm -hmm, mm -hmm, relatively bulky keyboard case versus using a good Bluetooth keyboard. Are there many situations where the iPad of a separate keyboard is worse? So, a couple things here. One is, Bluetooth keyboard is great, but where's the iPad? Is it yeah. in... A, it's got to be unless <laughs> you're using it like flat on a table uh, or something. I, that's bad ergonomics. I realize bad. now I did cut out part of this question, which which okay. is important. Where uh, they said that they were they thought that the studio neat canopy looked interesting, right? It's like a device to carry a keyboard in and then to use as a stand for whenever you want to use. Sure. That. So it's a combo. You've got to have a stand and a Bluetooth keyboard. Mm -hmm. It's perfectly reasonable. I have a I have a stand that I use when my iPad is on my um the bar of my kitchen mm -hmm. i put it in i clip it in and it and it puts it up high and then yeah. i use a i use a bluetooth keyboard and it's really nice when i'm mm -hmm. using it there but that's a whole setup where i've got yeah. a stand and all of that i've used i mean that that old studio neat um canopy was really nice as as a way of traveling with a keyboard separately and all mm -hmm. that but 
the beauty of the Magic Keyboard is that it is just a laptop. It's all in one. The stand is there. And it's the best experience because it's hovering over the keyboard. It's adjustable. It's all in one piece. And if you're working on your lap, which I do a lot, like I, I, I'm doing a lot of that on my lap in on the couch or out in a camp chair under the redwood tree in the summertime like that's in a scenario like that you got to have it all together but yeah sure on you also the table get the trackpad right like the trackpad is a is and a you get a trackpad yeah i end up for that product right when i'm working these days when i'm working on the um on the bar the bar top on sitting on a bar stool i will also have a trackpad that i bring out right um and so it is nice to have it all in one yeah, it is. It is. So there are, there are scenarios where I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to do this um, and travel with a keyboard. I just decided, and, and also you can save money because Bluetooth keyboards are way cheaper than the Magic Keyboard. You can absolutely save money doing it that way. But ideally, the Magic Keyboard is like a really good, it's just a good fit. If you need, if you're willing to spend the money and, and you want that kind of perfect fit, and good portability, it's it's worth it. But I, I absolutely use a mechanical keyboard <laughs> and an iPad when I'm inside at a you know at the bar, but that's not right. That that's only one use case where that makes sense. And Kurt asks, given that the M4 chip has a dedicated controller for the OLED tandem display in the iPad Pro. What are the chances that an M4 based MacBook Pro rumored for this year? and the M4 MacBook Airs for next year could have OLED displays. Related chances for an OLED display to pair with an M4-based Mac desktop later this year or next. Do you think that the... Basically, do you think the inclusion of the display controller for the OLED tandem display could indicate that we could see OLED displays in laptops? Yeah, I think I think it could mean that the MacBook Pros are getting OLED displays. I, not the MacBook Air. Mm. The prices don't make sense. Mm. In fact, I wonder if they do OLED for the MacBook Pros, if they might actually segment them further. And, you know, they all have that same really nice dis display now. But I wonder if that low-end M3 14-inch MacBook Pro, I wonder if the $1,500 to $2,000 range just keeps that screen, but they put an OLED in the higher-end screens. I wonder if that might be the way that they would do it. Um, not the MacBook Air. I thought this question was going to be: Does this mean that maybe it'll drive the MacBook Air will drive two external displays with with the lid closed? Maybe. And, and maybe I think tandem. I mean maybe like like a new display controller that's souped up like that. Um, it makes me think that maybe there are some Mac applications. This is a more broad answer. There are probably Mac applications for doing that. Like. The M4 is mostly not going in the iPad Pro, right? It's mostly going to go in Macs. Macs are going to, they're going to be more Macs out there with it than iPad Pros in the long run. So there are probably Mac reasons to have that display controller in there too. And they're just not talking about it because they don't have a Mac to talk about right now. So I would think that there are going to be some things. I also wonder if like, could it mean that it, it's got improved functionality for like the virtual display on the Vision Pro, like I don't know what all it might enable, but it does sure feel like they wouldn't have upgraded the display controller on the M4 just for the iPad Pro. It feels like mm. there are probably other applications for it, whatever they might be. Do you do you know? You might not know this, but like the the tandem system is it showing like two copies of the same thing? I think it is. I think I think it's one is right behind the other and they're showing the same thing and that's how you get the increased brightness. So like essentially if you were to like split it up, right? Like if you were able to like pull them apart and do something with it, you would have essentially two displays. Right. And they're they're both showing the same image. Right. But, but the pathway is is different. It's not like you're actually using two displays. This is I, I tried to get into this in detail at, with Apple in New York and, and there was a point beyond which they were just not willing to go they're like we could you could talk to our display people that we're not gonna let you talk to um because i wanted to know more about this but my understanding is that since it's sending the same signal to both panels it's not like the device is drawing things twice right it's drawing it once and telling both panels to draw the same thing so it's not 
right? You get it? Like it's it's it is more like driving one display, but yeah, if you pulled them apart, they're basically mirrored. Um, the thing that they have to do, and they did talk about this, which is fascinating, is every OLED panel has a different um, characteristic. Uh, like, not every dot on an OLED panel is has the same max brightness, which I did not know. They are all a little different. That's just a quirk of OLED. And so they have to be calibrated. Um, and so they put the screens through calibration, and you end up with like a calibration map of this pixel should only go this bright and this pixel should only go this bright. And the reason you do that is you want them all to be uniform, even though physically they're not uniform. If you don't do that, then a continuous uh, red or whatever ends up looking blotchy because they're all red, but they're all not quite the same. And so they have to do that. And what they told me is they have to do that and they have to do it for two different monitors and they have to have both of those displays do those at you know high resolution at high frame refresh on the fly they have to modify every single pixel that is coming from the computer uh has to be modified based on the calibration and they said that is the kind of thing that you need to do down at the very lowest level which is why they have the display controller doing the job so that part is really interesting that they're not the panels aren't the same and even the individual pixels on the panels aren't the same so they have to do a lot of massaging there but what they don't have to do is sort of like try to draw the same thing twice they draw it once and it gets sent to both panels so in that in that way they are identical and they're right behind each other and that and that's to get more brightness in there quinn uh at, at, at snazzy labs did a really good youtube video that i think we might have referenced last week but like he talked about tandem oled and how it's not this it's not one of those things that apple makes up and says oh it's the, you know the, the you know mega ultra display xdr pro those kind of words it's not that um it's existing technology that that has been talked about for quite a while and apple decided to actually implement in this way which is interesting if you would like to send in a question for a future episode of the show, for Ask Upgrade, for Snow Talk, whatever it is, you can also send in your follow-up at UpgradeFeedback.com. You can check out Jason's writing over at SixColors.com and hear his shows on TheIncomparable.com and here on Relay FM. You can listen to my shows here on Relay FM 2 and check out my work at CortexBrand.com. We're online. Jason is at JSnell, J-S-N-E-L-L. I am at iMike, I-M-Y-K-E. You can watch video clips of the show on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, where we are at Upgrade Relay. Thank you to our members who support us with Upgrade Plus and get longer ad-free versions of each and every episode. Go to getupgradeplus.com to find out more. Thank you to Wild Grain, Uni, and Delete Me for their support of this show. But most of all, thank you for listening. We'll be back next time. Until then, say goodbye, Jason Snow. Goodbye, Mike Hurley. Thank you.